Welcome to Sketchcraft, the podcast for art, design, and process junkies. I'm Rob Duenas, art director for Game Fan Magazine and Artist Esquire. This is an unedited podcast, which means that there is some cursing from time to time, so please be aware. Thanks for listening, and here we go. All right, hey, Rob Duane is here. Duane, yes. Uh, is your name Duane? Yes, that's how you pronounce it. Sketch Rants, episode 13. Ideas versus talent. Ideas versus talent. What the hell am I talking about? Um, or huh, putting your ideas onto paper. So, KL, KL Amrani from DeviantArt asks me... Uh, Based on your experience, how you feel one should balance their ideas and their skills. I've always felt like my ideas, quotation marks, are always ahead of my skill level as an artist. And I imagine that's something that I need to work on a lot. But really, just your opinion on the idea of an artist's focus. That balance between original ideas, character stories, and the technical aspects of structure perspective. Hope that's not too unclear. Um, also, preface that by... Which one takes precedence when an artist realizes he's focusing too much on the idea as opposed to the process? No, that's not it. What's your opinion on original characters and universes in relation to the basic construction perspective? So, what I sort of extrapolate from this KL, I'm getting confused, Cam. I want to say Kalo. Uh, K, uh, I'm Ronnie. Right. What I sort of extrapolate from this is what happens when your ideas exceed your talent. Okay? That's how I read it. And I know a lot about this. So let me take you all back, right, to the past, right, to the past, like 1997, right, 1997, 98, 1998, uh, I was in the Army, and my buddy, Richard, who joined the Army with me, well, not with me, but he joined the Army, we ended up together in Germany, yada yada, wanted to do a Star Wars fan film, or an animatic, or something like that, something, or wanted to make his own little Star Wars movie, and uh, I knew it was a you know, shot in the fucking dark, that would ever happen. But I took it pretty serious. So that would be kind of fun. Uh, he wanted me to write it, because I was doing a lot of writing. Uh, so I said, okay, I will. So I wrote something called Star Killer um, because I wanted to use that original name. I know now it's been used in the video games, but I want to use that name. And I didn't want to create anything like Star Wars. I didn't want Jedi, I didn't want anything. I wanted to do Kung Fu with Star Wars powers. That's basically what I wanted to do. This is 1998, 97, 98. I think he originally asked me before we got in the army and then followed up with it in basic. And then when we got overseas, again, was like, hey, I want you to write it. So um, I decided, okay, I'm going to write a script. And what a process that was. What I eventually created was a 72-page script because I based it on the same length of the original Star Wars script uh, story about a guy that, you know, had already left home, that call to action, the Luke Skywalker call of action, had already left home, uh, found out that the world was kind of a shitty place, and became sort of like a failed bounty hunter and just wasn't working out, you know. Everything he did, you know, he'd get jobs, he'd bumble them, he owed money, his rent, you know, his, his landlord's chasing him, he loses his job. And so, uh, meanwhile, back home, his home planet where he came from, in the Epicanthix region, right, it's all tarred into Star Wars lore, uh, they're having sort of a civil war, and they basically put a call to say, hey, you know, you need to come home and deal with your family shit. So he says, okay, rather than, you know, that call of wanting to leave home and get out in the universe, he's like, I want to go back to my childhood. I want to go back home. I want to go back. And you come home and the world's changed. It's never, it's not the way you remembered it. You've changed. And so that was the movie I wanted to make or the story I wanted to tell. And I quickly realized that I didn't know how to draw characters, spaceships, tell a story, do storyboards. I wrote something. It's a little technical, uh, but for fan fiction, it, and the ideas in there, it, I mean, I, I read it now, and I'm like, look, this is a little technical, and it's a little preachy in some areas. That being said, for a fan project, it's pretty good for being 19. So, but my ideas had surpassed my technical skill. So, right about that time, 
uh, Mononoke was kind of making the rounds in Europe, and then I think The Matrix came out, and my friends was like, hey, you know, this is like The Matrix. I'm like, great. So I bought the fucking storyboard book, figuring if this is like The Matrix, I'll know how to do this, because they put storyboards in there. I'll find out what a storyboard is. I'll get to see how they do it. And I did not understand anything. So that sort of brought me back to, like, model sheets and how to draw characters and construction and in, in about 98, 99, you'll say summer of 99, by the time I had a finished script and these other movies had come out and I bought these art of books and stuff, I started relearning how to draw. Um, what I initially realized was I have to let myself fail. You know, as an artist, when you have ideas that you want to do and they didn't work in so well, it doesn't look like the way it does in your head, you need to be okay with that and either do it again or realize what your real problems are and attack that. And usually it's the basics. Usually if you're having an issue drawing something or it's not working out, it's because your fundamentals are fucked up. It's not the rendering or the style or the way her lips look or the way her eyes move. It's usually because you don't understand construction perspective or how to invoke, you know, contrapasso emotion, get a character or whatever you relate. So um, I want to talk to you about how artists perceive failure versus real people. So my real people, I'm doing quotation marks. It means non-artists. So how artists perceive failure and how non-artists perceive failure or NAs. And uh, artists perceive failure, in my opinion, like this. Uh, they hate everything they do. <laughs> you know? They're the, the humble ones. Then there's a set of artists who think everything they do is fucking golden. That ain't true. But for the most part, artists tend to hate everything they do. I know I do. Um, what you can't do as an artist is allow that to affect you to move forward uh, and I'm also speaking to myself at this point you know uh, you can't allow what you consider to be a failure to affect your ability to complete a project you need to have a clear and concise goal usually picking one or two things to focus on and allow everything else to fall where it may and and really sort of achieve that goal if it's just to complete a comic then complete a comic if it's to you know, to make sure your backgrounds are detailed, make sure your backgrounds are detailed. If it's to make sure your characters are alive and you're not worried about backgrounds, then don't worry about backgrounds. You know, trying to make the world's greatest comic and where you draw color right, everything's perfect, just, it's just not going to work. I mean, most projects are made in a group of people. It's not one person doing everything. Anyhow. Um, and if it doesn't work out the way you want, you know, you sort of analyze what didn't work pick one or two things to work on again and then move forward with your next project. That's basically it. Uh, now, how non-artists perceive failure um, artistically, right? Speaking, like when they see art, uh, is that they can't do it. Uh, the fact that we create anything is like magic to normal people. It's like a magic trick. Uh, they're impressed with almost anything. So, uh, now will they buy it? That's another thing. But they'll be impressed with you creating things. Because, like, oh, you know, I always wish I could draw. And, or I, I do when I was younger, but I gave it up. Or we have a little artist in the family. And, you know, you can sort of allow, on some level, them to sort of, like, live vicariously through your art. If they're really, like, if it speaks to them. Uh, that's why they generally buy stuff. So, uh, you if you get all stressed out about how you draw hands or noses or ears and you prevent you from doing it or finishing a project, you understand that the average audience doesn't fucking care. They can't tell the difference. Matter of fact, they can't tell the difference between the computer-generated uh, monsters and makeup and whatever in the Lord of the Rings movie versus the ones in the Dungeons and Dragons movies. Or, like, I mean, they really can't. Or, or even back in the day, Dragonheart. Like, they, they kind of can't tell the difference. Uh, it can be a little frustrating because you're like, damn, I put all that effort in and they can't tell the difference. Well, you also have to pick what are you putting the effort in? Are you putting it in for you or are you putting it in for them? Uh, when I put in the, the real effort and I turn on the uh, the oh my God button uh, onto a piece, I'm putting that in for like the two percenters, including myself, who when they look in, they're going to see more and be like, God damn, you put that in. And I realize only like, 2% of my perceived audience is going to get that, maybe 1%. But I'm making that specifically for them. So, uh, if I feel like I'm not drawing a good piece, but I put that stuff in there, I can let it go. I mean, there's there's quite a few covers i worked on where I'm like, ah, this fucking is horrible. It looks just fine. Usually a year later, you go, damn, I wish I could do that again. You know, and then you're just like, just really weird snaking its own tail situation. 
Um, but to get back to what I was doing with Starkiller, it didn't work out. You know, we didn't make anything. I never got an animatic working. I didn't understand how to use Premiere. Uh, I had I had bitten off way more than I chewed, but because I shot big, right, I went for everything, I re quickly realized what my limits were. Now, I didn't allow that to negatively affect me from doing anything at all. What I did is, say, okay, well, I need to I need to work smaller. So then I wrote another story called Kalispell, based off a town I lived in, where I just wanted to basically talk about uh, kids who were, like, in an orphanage, and then nothing to do with that place in particular, just like the name. And uh, I went, and I, I sort of scripted it out, and I drew two different versions of it, and it was horrible. And then I found out that I, have an, I had a whole other problem. I was drawing flat. I had no volume to my art. Every now and then I could buzz up for some perspective, but all my characters were flat and kind of staring at me, and I was still stylizing hair and things because I didn't understand how to draw them. Couldn't draw people. So uh, then I went to art school, figuring that would help me. And that didn't. And then I read a book called uh, Sun Tzu's Art of War, which, of course, I knew about, but I never read it. And I found a little advice. Now, I'm remembering off the top of my head, so if, I, if I'm if i not accurate on this, don't, don't email me about it. But what I remember and what kind of affected me was that Sun Tzu talked about doing better. You don't have to win the war. You just have to do better than people expect you to. Uh, especially in the art world, I found that to be really, really helpful because a lot of people sort of, Artists would go, oh, Rob, you're so great. And then, you know, secretly like, oh, you know, fucking whatever. They, you know, there's a level of competitiveness. Or or I expected myself to completely fail, you know. So if I didn't actually really fail, you know, and I actually had people saying, hey, that's pretty cool. Here's a buck. Here's five bucks. I took that as a major win because I needed a series of little wins. He also talks about giving yourself little wins, you know. Win the little battles. Win all the little ones. And soon you'll have, like, you know, a series of wins, Rather than trying to chip off a huge project, give yourself a bunch of little ones. If it's going to be, today I'm going to draw one sketch card, tomorrow I'm going to paint one sketch card. Then I'm going to draw one, then I'm going to paint one. Then I'm going to draw one, then I'm going to paint one. But you start thinking, well, I'm going to draw and paint one a day, and then, wow, that was, I did that like maybe four hours. That means tomorrow I can do like three of them. I'm going to spend the whole day. You're probably going to get like half a sketch card done after that. Because your mind has sort of constructed a bunch of things that don't fucking exist. And... Um, <laughs> I do this all the time. It's constructed a bunch of fucking things that don't exist. And uh, you're sitting there not making anything for some stupid reason, the way the mind works. Um, because you didn't really give yourself a goal. You sort of overloaded your mind with a bunch of work to do. And then you don't want to do anything. And you maybe you're not recognizing what that is, but that's what it is. So then uh, in school, I met up with some people who wanted to make a book called Ukiyo. And I went and did artwork on that. And got a little better, but again, realized a lot of other limitations in art. Uh, that didn't work out. So then I pulled back, and about three, you know, two, two years went by, and I met a man named Adam Kogan on the internet, and he wanted me to draw a book of his called, uh, well, he's going to make one called Dream Vacation. That didn't work out, so I asked him if he could just hand me something that was already written, and he handed me something called Mosaic. So about the third year after Ukiyo, I got into designing Mosaic and actually drew test pages. And we spent two years going to Comic-Con and selling it. And we sold it to Image finally. And then we didn't make the book for whatever reason. I'm not going to get into it. So that's a failure. But I realized a lot of my issues. I realized that I wasn't a good colorist in terms of like sequential art. I had no idea what I was doing. I overdrew everything. All the backgrounds I blew up to 11 by 17. Did these big like animation style map boards for no fucking reason. Create all sorts of hell on myself for no reason. Realize I had a hard time drawing backgrounds because like, well, that's just going to be a squiggle. How's the colorist and the inker going to know? I mean, how's the colorist, whoever colors this, how are they going to know? Am I going to, if I'm coloring this, how am I going to know? I didn't understand impressionism and things like that. So then I pulled away from that and got a job in t-shirts. And then two years, three years later, uh, I ended up meeting, that was about a year later, actually, I met the guys at Ape, and they picked me up to design and draw Monstroids. And I spent two or three years, uh, while well, we drew a zero issue, took forever to get scripts, finally got the first issue going, and then my whole company went bankrupt at play, and lost my job, and we went to go make Game Fan. So that fell through. While I was at play, I also picked up Dead Junior. So the idea was that during the week, I would be drawing Dead Junior, and on the weekends, I'd draw Monstroids. So I figured, well, I'll do three or four pages during the week on Dead Junior, and then I'll do, like, two pages on the weekend, right? So if I drew three pages complete, inked and done, and set up my pages on the weekend for Monsters, I can do that and then do five pages a week between the two of them. And Dead Junior had, like, a shifting deadline, so it was okay. Uh, the company that owned Dead Junior went out of business. 
So they lost the license, Konami owns it, or they don't know they do, and then Play went out of business, so Dead Junior failed and Monfrance failed. So uh, I can count on hand one fan project, two fan projects, three fan, so three fan projects, and three comic books that I set out to do, and I completely failed every time. Um, big time. Uh, but the world moves on. So what have I been successful at? You know, when you sort of start thinking, you know, a lot of those things I either blew out of proportion or or I just had a vision that I wasn't able to achieve and I really tried really hard to achieve it, pushing myself artistically as much as I can uh, every time. Well, what it sort of allowed you me to do, what I learned from that, what gave me other wins was, case in point, with Uki on Mosaic, I learned how to do character designs and model sheets, and actually, you know, with clothing, learned how to design outfits and stuff, which came in handy in doing character design work, and and uh, even on all my cover work, I designed a lot of that stuff. So uh, that's helpful. Did all the monstrous designs, so that was kind of cool. Uh, got me into t-shirt work, which you know, again, helped my graphic design. Uh, those things also got me noticed by by Play, which you know did keep me employed for about two years. Uh, the graphic design, the work I did on Monster is doing graphic design with the lettering and the whole way I was designing the look of the book uh, led me to doing Game Fam. The digital inking that I did on Death Junior, matter of fact, drawing completely digital, all the groundwork I did on Death Junior and then back into the first issues of Monster as I never saw publication, led me to being able to completely draw digitally to the point where now, you know, on the covers of Game Fam and the stuff for Big Dog, people can't tell what the fuck it is I'm doing. So... And then the conventions all came out of that. Me going to conventions, me learning how to sell books and ideas to editors and stuff at conventions, or selling my own art at conventions, which in turn, you know, created a, a financial deficit because I lost my job, which then got me into doing commissions on DeviantArt and self-promotion and this podcast you listen to here now. So when I talk about ideas that you're not able to accomplish um, and how do you sort of chip away at them is pick one thing out of that idea to focus on and make that your win. And everything else is ancillary. And then move forward. And, you know, on one hand, you'll have a string of things that didn't work out. And on the other hand, you'll have a string of things that did. And you would never be able to arrive at the position you are in life if you try to do everything perfect all at once. Basically what I have to say about that. So, um, and never give up, you know. When shit fails, shit fails, you know. It's a 50-50 toss. Sometimes, you know, you, you know, it works in your favor. Sometimes it don't. But as artists, we tend to dwell on the things that didn't go right. You know, I can get, you know, I can get a thousand comments on DeviantArt uh, in a week, and they're all positive. And then, you know, you see two people on some blog that post your sketches, and they're like, he's fucking horrible. And it's like, well, which one am I going to focus on? You know, I, mean, I don't want to delude myself into thinking that I make good art if it's bad art. You have to be very self-critical in that, that fashion. But you can't allow what you perceive to be a failure um, hinder you from attempting to do better. And if you recognize what the real problems going on in your work, and it's usually nine times out of ten, fundamentals, construction, perspective, shading, basic color theory, storytelling. You could tell a great story with just stick figures. Uh, Noma has a great storytelling feature by one of the Pixar storyboard artists. Go look it up. Uh, if you want to know construction, Noma has a really great DVD. I've said this before by Scott Robinson. It's one of the earliest DVDs ever made, Basic Perspective. Go pick that up. They have a great color theory. It's a little boring to listen to. Listen to it for about 20 minutes a day. And then work in mixed media where you don't have access to a billion colors. And then, then go back into Photoshop and apply those techniques. You know, Learn to develop things in value first and then go color the value sketches. So you, you're able to, to deal with the rendering on one level and then color on the next. And those things will generally, are generally the problems you have, you know, uh, until you get to a certain level where, you know, it's other stuff. And I'm not going to get into that because we're up on our time limit. So, hey, thanks for all listening. I uh, hope any of that made sense. And if not... Uh, feel free to email me. You can get a hold of me at sketchcraft.com, sketchcraft.net, sketchcraft on Facebook, my DeviantArt. Uh, all the links are on sketchcraft.com. I have a Tumblr. If you're a Tumblr fans, please uh, follow me. I follow you, etc., etc. Uh, good at all talking to you. Talk to you soon. Bye. <laughs>